Welcome to lecture 24 of our series on prosody. In the previous lecture, we, we wrapped up our overview of the functions of prosody. Now it's time for two lectures on technology. First on prosody as it is used or could be used in speech synthesis, and then in the next lecture on dialect systems. We'll review in this lecture why prosody is hard to model and see why humans are still better than machines for some purposes. As usual, we'll focus on needs, approaches, and models, not specific algorithms or software packages. So, some history. Starting with a classic synthesized voice. This is the Tech Talk speaking. Right now, you are hearing my perfect Paul voice. However, I also have other presets. Okay, let's listen again, thinking about what prosody we hear, if any. This is the Tech Talk speaking. Right now, you are hearing my perfect Paul voice. Okay, what prosody did you hear? Or does it seem like a trick question? Now the voice is very robotic, and in fact ro voices like this are popular for robots in movies, starting with HAL in 2001 A Space Odyssey. And yes, robots stereotypically have bad prosody, but a truly prosody vo prosody-free voice would have each phoning the same length and same height, and that's not the case here. If I started talking about elephants and giraffes, it would really impair your understanding versus elephants and giraffes. So we don't want to impose a high cognitive load on listeners, so some basic prosody is absolutely critical. And this was understood from the various earliest days of speech synthesis building. At a minimum, synthesizers need to respect lexical accent, mark phrasing and boundaries, and do this by controlling pitch height and duration. Now let's look at some architectures for synthesis. Starting with the earliest, rule-based systems. These relied on rules, handwritten rules, like those shown here indicating the stress patterns for every word, how to realize those stress patterns, rules what to do for punctuation, and so on. Now these early systems were based on unit selection and concatenation. <clears throat> a unit was just a piece of speech for a word or a syllable chopped out of a recording done by some human speaker. Given a text input, these systems would break it into units, look up the speech signal for each piece, and then concatenate them. The prosodic rules could then operate on the result to produce the output waveform. For those rules to work, they needed to know something about the phrase structure of the input, so there was some basic parsing for that. Further tags might be available, so that you could specify some aspects of how you wanted the speech to be realized, for example with emphasis on one word. The next generation of synthesizers used learning. Rather than relying on handwritten rules, they used models of the prosodic effects, learned from the training data. Importantly, these were not absolute, they were statistical. Being learned from data, large data sets were needed. In order to create a voice, you might need a few hours of speech from one patient speaker. Further, rather than direct operations to modify the speech signal, the prosody model would produce targets, and then some concatenation and smoothing module would produce speech that met the targets as well as possible, while avoiding choppy or jerky transitions. Th this was the hidden Markov model, or the HMM itself. The innovation of using learned parameters everywhere dramatically improved naturalness. The third generation of synthesis systems are end-to-end -end systems. These have no intermediate representations, nothing in them that's designed at all. Rather, they map directly from a grapheme sequence of letters of ca or characters to a sound sequence. This requires deep neural networks. And not just any networks, because prosody is context dependent. You can't just choose the prosody of one word looking at that one word. Um, so it requires some recurrence or attention to model those context effects. Since they have to learn everything, they require much more data. For example, Takatron, some 40 hours. Uh, as these systems are completely black box, there is no way to understand them or control them, uh, but doing both are active research topics. So these models often perform very well. While we don't know exactly what they learn, they probably learn how to compute all the text features that affect pronunciation, and maybe some factors beyond just the words and local structure. So how many syllables, is it a name? Those are things the earliest systems could do. But these newer models could be doing arbitrarily complex uh, inference. And then they also learn how these factors in combination affect the pitch, intensity, and duration. So how do they work? Well, we won't go into machine learning. We won't talk about the models, the, the architectures, the training process, but let's talk about the training data and the loss functions. So at a high level, just like any machine learning problem, these systems map an input to an output. 
They learn to do this from the training data, which consists of matched pairs of text sequences and speech signals. The training objective is to handle unseen data correctly. For example, if we know how we want to say geraniums only in, then we can feed that text to the model, see what it outputs, and do a comparison. Uh, if, the, if it's exactly the same, if the output of the system is exactly the same as we had in the training data, beautiful. Otherwise, we compute the difference, the error or the loss, and use that to improve the model so it does better next time. Computing the loss is a major issue. Uh, one problem is that there's many equally valid ways to say any text output input. Another problem is that there are really no good models of similarity. There's no way to predict whether some little difference in the prosody will be perceived as insignificant to humans or completely unacceptable. Uh, human judgments are the only real way to evaluate quality. But in practice, it's common to just compute uh, spectral differences, MFCCs, or sometimes also differences in F0 you know, between the system output and the target output, sometimes using dynamic time warping. There's many other choices in modeling. For example, the output for some systems is the signal directly, but for others, the output is a spectral representation, which is then converted to an actual speech signal by a vocoder. Some vocoders take only the spectral information, others take in addition the desired pitch, and maybe the per-syllable durations. So some models predict those explicitly. Okay, that was a very simplified overview. Speech synthesis systems today are often very good. There are definitely synthesized voices out there that are better than most human voices for some applications. Certainly I think they're better than my voice for intelligibility, naturalness, and aesthetic appeal. But there's a lot of room for improvement. So we can evaluate speech system, system, system technology from three perspectives. First, do they manage to use all the important prosodic features? No, they don't. Uh, pitch and duration, yes. The features in pink seem to be handled by some systems, but I've seen little or no evidence, even in research systems, for control of voicing and other features. Now this is okay sometimes. Prosodic features are often mutually redundant, so the lack of one or two features may have zero practical input impact for many applications, <coughs> but there are still missed opportunities. And this will likely become more important as we move beyond just the phonological functions. That is to say, as speech synthesizers start to do more than just text to speech, that is, just producing a good rendition of a sequence of words, uh, they will need more control. Extensions to handle paralinguistic side of things is one interesting direction, such as adding various forms of expressiveness, and working towards producing speech in the voice of a new speaker for which there is little data. And yes, there are ethics concerns there. <coughs> but really the big prize is the pragmatic functions. The ideal speech synthesizer will produce speech that is dialogue capable, able to produce all the patterns we discovered, discussed in lectures 21 and 22, and to superimpose them. This is beyond the capabilities of current systems. That's why the voices of most commercial systems today are still produced by human talent. Imagine a banking system that says, thank you for authenticating, now how may I help you? Without marking the topic transition or having some degree of positive assessment or having a clear turn yield. Users would hate it. Instead, of course, we want something like, thank you for authenticating, now how may I help you? That's far beyond the state of the art. In any case, we'll talk more about the needs of dialogue in the next lecture. So all of this sort of prefigures also my next point. Today's synthesizers are good mostly just for information delivery and related functions. And that's not surprising because they're mostly trained on non-dialogue data. Clearly we need to instead train them on data taken from real dialogues. That's easier said than done. One problem is entanglement, which to reuse aside from the previous lecture, arises because many different kinds of functions are superimposed in a single speech signal. How do you automatically disentangle these streams informa of information during learning to create systems where the intent can be varied independently of the words? Or the pragmatic force? Or the speaker identity? Or even to change the language for speech-to-speech -speech translation applications? These are active research topics, with every month new papers coming out on prosody transfer, style transfer, and disentanglement. Okay, so that's it for speech synthesis. In the next lecture, We'll discuss the uses of prosody in dialogue systems.